Could you say that again quickly? Yeah. So what? Uh, what was I saying? <laughs> oh, oh, this is a fairly long talk. Oh, no, I thought you said you gave it to a group called the... Oh, I no, oh, gave it to Long Standing College. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I heard you on PBS. Did yeah. Okay. Well, that's kind of like, we know what we're talking you. about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. And I'll note the... For those of you who follow the Facebook page, we did they, they posted the interview online. Oh, yeah. Lori Walsh posted you and Adrian, so I, the video is up on the Facebook page as of like Great. two this afternoon. So, because I didn't know we were going to be on film. Like, yeah, you know, I'm never on film. <laughs> Probably just might have shaved or worn something nice. <laughs> yeah, that's who was doing it, but they. When we got there, they said, oh, by the way, we're going to be filming you and Adrian, me here and Adrian there. So, yeah. Anyway. Who's ever heard of the archaeologist in Italian? Last year. I uh, had some drunken t-shirt and had a favorite. You look, probably look real. <laughs> you want to be. Yes. Anyway, this talk. This talk is, for a number of years, I've worked on a few bison sites. But we intensified this project in the last two years because of what is called a multiple properties document documentation form. That is, uh, the Historic Preservation Office in Pierre wrote this so that whenever we have a bison kill and we have certain criteria, such as it has site integrity, we know the age, function, uh, some of the herd demographics, the seasonality, species, and whether it's a successful kill, and what we can glean from the planning that went into this. When we have that data, it can automatically go on to the National Register of Historic Places. So that's the reason behind this. So we revisited a few sites that I've worked on in the past, and we, we sent about some new sites. So first of all, what is the bison kills we're dealing with are of one kind only, and that is communal. There's a lot of places out there in the landscape where you know you might see a dead bison, you might even see it was butchered. Did the bison kill? Well, the bison was killed, it was processed, but that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for group hunts. So we can learn more about the cultures that worked on these sites. So we have identified three types of bison kills in the northern plains. Ambush, tracks, and jumps. Now, whenever you say bison kill, the first thing that comes to everybody's mind is driving bison off the steep cliffs. Somebody standing over here, the Louisville slugger, you know, knocking out some of the other ones. Uh, and they did. This, these go back in time. Well, there's one site in North America. It's the earliest one. It's called Head Smash Den in Canada. That dates to around the earliest component dates to around 6,000 years ago. And then through time, it gets used more heavily. We don't have any confirmed jumps in this state. Out of all the bison kills, this is the boar bison jump. Well, actually, they call it the buffalo jump, but we don't have buffalo in this country. They're bison. Uh, what they did here, you can see this tall, it's, it's just a, they drove them off the top of this cliff down to the bottom. They started doing this around AD 1550. So that, that was part of what's called the Little Ice Age. And during that climatic episode, we probably had more bison in the plains than at any time in history or prehistory. Uh, we had what was devastating people in the continent of Europe made this a much nicer place for bison. We had more moisture. We had a lot more lush landscape out there, vegetation. And when you have that, the bison numbers skyrocket. Regardless how many people are out here munching on them, they skyrocket because they can't. So we have boar. 
This is the Sanson bison jump, or bison kill, in uh, Custer County. We think it's a bison kill, and we think it is because of this right here. It's a drive line. There's another one sort of over here. They, 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 it, they terminate right here on the edge of this cliff, and it's a pretty steep drop below that. Larry Agenbrod worked on this quite a few number of years ago, and he excavated right below where this drive line terminates. He found a little bit of deer bone, one bison bone, and a hearth. Does that mean it's not a kill site? No, because it has these features right here, these drive lines terminating at a cliff. Whether it was successful or not is another matter. Also, there's a stream right now. This is where the bison jump was. The stream right now runs like that. At that point in time of the use, it might have been back here, and through time it just migrated itself and destroyed the site. That's one possibility. The other one is this site just failed its function as a bison kill, or somebody messed up during the process of trying to drive the bison to this location. Another site south of Hermosa, uh, I've mapped some of the cairns right here, and the, and the landowner says they stretch for about two miles that direction. And we didn't map these, we didn't have time, but as we were driving to this spot here, I saw more cairns over here. These white dots here and here are the cairns. This is a very steep escarpment, every bit as steep as a Sanson Ranch. Uh, we never had taken a back go down here to look, but, you know, it also has a stream down here. There may or may not be anything left. We don't know. But we're including sites like this in this uh, multiple, nation, multiple nomination form. As long as they have certain features. Uh, there was some processing activity they found the last year or the year before that uh, doesn't really relate to a bison kill. Come on. Uh oh. oh for some reason. Huh. It's gonna it's gonna fail. back this up once. There's one other place in South Dakota that's probably bison kill related, driving them off steep cliffs. And that's called the jump off up in Harding County. This very steep escarpment runs for miles and miles and miles and miles. You go out there and you walk any of the slopes or the base and you'll see bison bone all over the place. However, there's no accumulation of bison bone. This area erodes so quickly that it moves sediments all over the place very rapidly, destroys sites, so it probably was the location of many, many bison kills, but we can't prove it. Ambush is the next type. And throughout most of prehistory, this is most this is how most bison have been taken. Early on, during Clovis period, they ate bison, but they didn't have communal bison kills, and they didn't take many. They didn't need to. They were small groups. All you need to do is stick one of these things. And ambushing bison is much easier than a person thinks. First of all, if this is a known location where bison would move back and forth from one part of the area to the other. You know, just hide anywhere in there, propel a dart or shoot an arrow into their lungs, animals dead. Bison have one lung. You make that, you that, you the animal's going to die. Maybe not just right there, but very soon that animal's already dead, just doesn't know it yet. So sometimes we'll find bison in ambush spots, other times we don't. Uh, traps are the most common bison kill in all of North America. They come in several varieties. 
some people say bogs, frozen lakes, make good traps. Personally, with all the landscape out there on solid ground, it'd be a lot more fun to butcher there than they would be in a bog. Uh, other ones, snow drifts in the winter, where you drive them into snow drifts. You can suffocate them, you can tra get them trample each other, anything like that. Sand dunes, uh, there's a very famous Casper site in Wyoming. They drove bison into these parabolic sand dunes, and they were very successful. Uh, but arroyos, the most common period. And these things are fascinating because this probably formed in less than a year. You have bison in the area, and you're aware of this location. You can get them to go in that direction and just get them into the arroyo, track both ends. You've got them. If they're easy pigeons. Yeah. Um, then, you know, five years later, it's pretty great. Five thousand years later, another arroyo cross cuts that, and lo and behold, we have ice on both sides of this. So, we see this a lot, and you'll see it on hill slopes, where arroyos are cutting the hill slope, and they use that to good them up these arroyos to the midpoint, where they can't get them going any further. And you have people on either side of this arroyo throwing darts and killing bison. There's a couple other things. First, modified arroyos and traps and pounds. This is a pound. Uh, quite often, you'll use this in conjunction with an arroyo. You'll have an arroyo going upslope, and at the end of this, you'll build this big pound. This has it going kind of the other direction. But uh, once they get into that enclosure, this is all brush covered. They can't really see through it. Bison have, first of all, they have total eyesight. They have incredible smell and hearing, but terrible eyesight. So they see anything that looks like an impediment, they're not going there. So once you get in here, you close the gate. Everybody gets on the fence with their bows and arrows or spears and puts them down. This is a place in uh, west of Hot Springs. Um, this law has this very long arroyo. It goes for about a mile. It's a fairly steep site. All you got to do is get bison in there a mile or two up and drive them. Get them to the next point right here and close it off. You have them trapped. You can feed them. <laughs> you can do anything you want. You don't have to kill them right away. You can take leisurely this back to these bison as needed. This is called the, the bull trap or the bull pen because up to the mid historically they would drive bulls up that arroyo, close the gate until they needed their services or, or whatever. So and we see a lot of this in the Red Canyon. There's places all over the southern hills where this would be so easy to do. The problem is they erode so quickly too that very few of them are preserved. So where are all the bison kills? There are 32 sites in this state recorded as bison kill, which is so incredibly low. Compared to there's more than that in most counties in Montana and Wyoming. Uh, one of the reasons nobody goes out and looks for them. I mean, I do know of at least, I can probably sit and pick a pen that are probably very good bison kills, but I haven't been to yet. Well, it's one or two, I may at some point in time, but for right now, I haven't. Uh, so anyway, they're kind of all over the state. They cluster up here in Harding County. And the reason for that is Harding County is an area of immense erosion. And it is eroding all the time. It's exposing sites, it's destroying sites, exposing them and burying them. Uh, so you just have to be there at the right time on a lot of these sites up there. We're going to look at several. Uh, four of them in Harding County, one in Fall River, and one in Hand County. These are sites where we looked at quite a few others. 
that were in western South Dakota. And the others we looked at, the other six or seven, are not kill sites. It might have some bone, bison bone in the cut bank or profile, but they are not where they killed bison. It might have brought some parts back to camp multiple times, and it looks like a lot of bison, but in fact, they're just, it's just a processing site in camp where they live. So we're going to start with the K faucet site. If you look out right now, I'm on top, well not on top, but I'm near, I'm getting up above the site looking down. You see this hummocky surface, all these bumps and things. These are all blocks that slid off from the top of the hill over time. This is the end of a, of a terminal end of a glacial moraine. And so this glacier would have pushed all these sediments to a point and stopped. Would have written up a little bit over the hill and deposited material with this very loose, consolidated materials that these glaciers brought in, over looking at this overlaying a very weak geology, consisting of very weak, thin beds of limestone on top of shale. So What's happened over time, when it's dry, sure you get a little bit of erosion, but all these sediments want to go down slope. There's 300 feet different between there and the top, which is pretty enormous, especially when you have all this unconsolidated material on top of real weak geology. So when it's dry, everything's fine, but when it gets saturated for two or three years in a row, things start moving. And you have mass wasting. And that's what we have here. Just another view of the bison exposed there. Uh, so what we did, uh, first of all, you'll never find a site more fun to work on than this one. You get to the cut bank and you can stand and excavate. <laughs> not on your knees, not with your head, a meter down in the ground. You're standing. Well, I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to work on a site with soft sediments and material right here. Uh, so I've made it a lot of fun. This is kind of the bison where we're working is, of course, right there where you see the people. Uh, there's no bison bone represented here, but this is part of that scar that slipped about six years ago and exposed this. You could be there six years ago, you would never know there was a bison kill there. But because we had several years, or they had several years of a lot of moisture, a lot of ground moisture, and moisture on top of that, and on top of that, things started moving again. This is looking, this is the hill top up here. This is one of the major scars that's happened in the past four years. This is a, the weak scar, but we're getting our bison right through there. So it won't be long before this is reburied again by other mass wasting. We went up on top and looked around for any evidence, any, where they might have driven them over the top. This is a very, very poor location. Uh, bison, for a bison jump to be successful, you got to, you, they can't know there's a drop off there. Or they're, they're going to go that way. They're not going to be able to force them to go over that cliff. So we're pretty confident that they drove them up valley or up the hill slope into one of these crevices created by these slump blocks. And there they were, one went over another and they started dispatching them with those narrows as quickly as they could. We invited, because of where it was, eastern South Dakota, I thought this would be a great opportunity for, for the Archaeological Research Center, Black Hill State, Augustana College, and USD and SDAS members to all work together in one group, hoping that one of these agencies, other than this one, would say, We'd like to take this over and continue working here. It hasn't occurred yet. USD has wanted to, but 
Whether they do or not, I don't know. But it's it's a wonderful site. So we had USD and Augie, and we had some uh, Black Hill State there. But all these students left before it was time to backfill. <laughs> so, uh, but here's what makes this so significant to me as a researcher. But there's a lot of other sites in this area. This area has never been surveyed. There's this site right here, which has been destroyed over the years by people just bidding on it. Uh, this one right here, that's destroyed maybe three years ago by people going out heavy machinery to recover artifacts from the stone bed. And this one right here, the one we're working on. Uh, uh, before I tell you why I think it's so fascinating, I'll keep going a little bit. When we were first out there, I recovered this manual from a, from a juvenile bison. And that is one of the best indicators of time of year this event took place. This was a late spring, early summer kill. Uh, these are the arrowheads right there. This is the date. Uh, uh, 809 radiocarbon years ago, which equates to roughly AD 1180 to 1200, so AD 1270. This is the same time period as the villages on the James River, the initial middle Missouri. If any of you have ever been to the Mitchell site, those are the people using this. And I know that not because we found pottery that proves it, but the other two sites are initial middle Missouri. This one dates to the same period, so I'm convinced the same population was coming back to this location time after time. And I think if a person had surveyed this area, they would find a lot of kill sites. The historic document literature dealing with bison rope trade before Europeans were in this area, other than within fur, fur trade posts, some years, the majority of all the hides they would recover in a year would come from the Reed Hills. So it has so much potential all around the same stretches for miles and miles. All oh, these goalies and arroyos and things, potential. So it's so easy for people to trap bison. But I'm sure they did it hundreds and hundreds of times. Um, well, so what we know about K fossil site. First of all, if you look right here, you see articulation. You look down on it, and yes, there is some articulation. I mean, femur next to you know, the, the bones are roughly in the same location. If you're digging a unit, you find this bone, you're probably going to find that bone somewhere in. So they're not only killed here, but they processed here, which is an important aspect. Well, didn't mean to do that. So anyway, it, uh, they were processing in the same gully as the kill event took place. Rather than taking the best parts and dragging them over there and working on them, they were working on them right there. There are numerous bison there. Again, it's initial middle Missouri. Other, initial, other sites are in the area. Late spring or summer, they were driven into a royal caused by mass wasting. Uh, but we need more excavation. We got. Uh, Two units completely excavated, and about uh, five of them started. So we need a lot more advice and bones from this location to begin to say anything about the demographics of the herd, male, female, what ages, things of that nature. But clearly by this time, the modern advice and bison. This is a site in Fall River County, Elliott Hay site. It sits right here at the base of this cliff. This is what it looks like today. You'll see some right here is road cut. Here, there's a big deep pit that you really can't see that was excavated back in the 60s for a sludge pit. They were gonna put an oil well here. This is where the sediments were gonna go that we generated from drilling holes and stuff. And then back here, 
You get a bulldozer trench. That's where the equipment was going to be set up. Never got done what they did do, the destruction. Uh, this is Bob Alex, the late Bob Alex. He was our first uh, state archaeologist in the state. Uh, Orville brought, and you all know Orville Elliott, uh, Orville brought, finally talked Bob into coming out and looking around, and because of the density of bone that he was seeing, and artifacts and stuff like that, Bob said this clearly a kill site. But we didn't know how they killed him yet. We still don't know how they killed him. Uh, so Orville has been after me to come out and look at this, and I thought, why don't we include this in our, in our study area? Just another view, this is back in the 70s or 60s, yeah, 70s, I believe, of what it looked like then. And if you look here, where they're working is about almost two meters beneath the top of the slope there, of the original ground surface. Uh, so we went out uh, early part of last year. And the only thing we found was in this area over here, we found a lot of what looked like bites and processing area. A lot of uh, teeth, flakes, uh, bits of broken bone. So they were processing bison right there. Do we know it's clearly related to that? No, we don't yet. It's going to require more work. But we couldn't see bison bone anywhere other than right there. So we put in some trenches. The first trench right here, this was the old bulldozer trench it was placed. Now you have to remember, since Bob was there in the 70s, this is built in, the sediment's about this high. So whatever was there was buried. We put in two trenches starting from the wall out, right here, trench three and four, and we get some trench and right there. This is that area where we have all the flakes and bison bone fragments and bison teeth. Uh, so this is Steve Holland. Uh, we went down about a meter, which would be equivalent to two meters of the original ground surface, and we found a bone down. We didn't do much in the way of digging, but we did screen all the sediments that came from that general area. We brought them back here. We did get quite a bit of bone from there, but not enough to tell us what we need to know. The other trenches, at a depth of two meters, we get a lot of bicycle. So, and that was quite some distance away. So we're covering a pretty good size area, at least the width of from the wall to me, where we have bison at a depth of two meters. So it looks like it's one single event. Uh, where that uh, sludge pit was, we had them scrape the wall, and we found a hearth right here. Uh, again, we don't know if it's related to that, but it's two meters from depth. So it could be, you know, part of the processing living area. You get up on top of those cliffs, this is what it looks like. Ideal landscape and grasses and habitat for bison. And there's, you wouldn't have to drive them there. They want to go there. The grasses, I mean, you could. We haven't, no one surveyed this out there. We don't know if there's drive lines or anything like that out there, but it's a lush area that would, bison would want to come to. So once you got them there, it's not very, from here to the far wall, to drive them over the edge. Any location in there. And when Bob was out there, not only did they find bison bone right there, but any erosional spot all along this wall, you could find what he thought was bison. So it's an area that was probably used over and over and over again. However, ours was just used once. Here's our date, uh, 2880, which puts it in the late archaic. We don't have any points. We have some tools, but we don't have any points yet. But all the sites that date to that period in Western South Dakota would have these corner star points. Say that again. Which what are the name of the points? Uh, well, they're just corner notch oh, dark corner. points. Okay. Yeah. They have names, but it's uh, 
you know, names from points from Canada. And so I think we just call them corner notch dark points. Everybody knows, oh, you got LiDAR cake slide. Yes, we do. So what do we know about it? LiDAR cake, uh, we have an area of bison processing, bison depth, depth of two meters over a wide area, multiple bison of various age, and other possible kill locations in the area. So if a little more work, it would be easy to put this one on the National Register right away. Uh, this is the Ladner Bison Kill in Harding County. We know the least about this because a landowner died about a year ago. We've been trying to get in touch with the new landowner, but he hasn't responded to any of my mail mailings yet. Uh, what we have here, this is a spring, and this is very weak geology. It's all, it's all bedded shales. A lot of us reworked bedded shales. So there's slick and slides and faults and stuff like that in it. So when it gets too wet, it's the same thing. You have mass wasting where blocks start sliding downhill. Uh, this is what, I'm going to back this up. This stream is running that direction. And for about a mile, the cut banks have an immense amount of bone in. It's being generated from the erosion here, that's being eroded, and the bones carry downstream and reburied and re exposed over and over again. So, we're going to be looking at this area, let's see, yeah, right, right in here. This is what it looks like. There are five one, two, another one right beneath that three, another one there, four, and five. At least, at a minimum, there's five episodes of bison killing at this location. Another view is kind of washed out, but you're looking down, and there's a huge scatter of bison bone up here where it's eroding away. Uh, Steve is probably standing at the bottom layer right there, and I'm kind of halfway down. So, but again, the problem is we don't know if it's at an angle like this or, or what. We're almost confident, almost has to be an arroyo kill that filled back in and then a lot of moisture and these, this block slid. They rotate when they slide quite often like that. Um, so it's going to take a lot more work to really point out how this was this happened, but it's got to be an arroyo because there's nothing else there that would lend itself to taking bodies. Uh, the date, very late archaic, uh, essentially it's 950 BP or uh, 1024 to 1155 calendar age AD. At this point in time, all the sites I've seen in Harding County that deal with bison are always what we call Auburn Lee, which is a population that uses points just like this. There's also a late prehistoric population in Wyoming that has arrow points that might be Shoshone. We don't know. Uh, we we're pretty sure Auburn Lee is Shoshone base, but uh, we don't exactly know who that group is. Of course, that could, it could be any group from anywhere in the plains coming up to South Dakota to hunt ice. Uh, the next site we're going to talk about is the bird dust site. We think we know what we're talking about here. What I can tell you for sure, you have never worked on soil that's harder than this, anywhere, any place. Uh, these are, and we're talking, this is a Cody Complex site. The Cody Complex dates to around 9,900 years to 8,000 years ago. It's a paleo Indian site very elegant tools and points and things like that. These are some of the sites in the, in the plains where we have Cody complex. A lot of these up here are Cody kills, where they kill multiple bison. The interesting thing about Cody is when we have these big communal kills, you have populations coming from all over. You might have them coming up from Oklahoma or Texas down from North Dakota, 
uh, far, you know, from Kansas this direction, Colorado or Wyoming this way, and they all meet once a year to hunt bison again. Not only hunt bison, but to for men to acquire wives, wives to acquire husbands, trade, talk, you know, bond together. Uh, that was probably more necessary than the actual bison was. In this case, though, it's a very small, this is a very small killing ant we're talking about here. And at the bird death site, it sits right there. Uh, I won't go through that. Our, our main questions were how many occupations are there at this site? Because as I show you, it kind of looks like there's more than one. Uh, how old is the component? Uh, what's the definition, depositional and taphonomic history, where do the raw materials come from, and what kind of subsistence activity does the site represent? Well, it represents one, the taking and processing of bison. On the bottom are the points from the site. Again, they're extraordinarily well made. Alberta and all Cody points, I think they're the finest lithic tradition they're not pale in the period. Just marvelous, beautiful things. Uh, these are points, uh, Cody points, Alberta, Scott's Bluff, Eden, from very, very well dated sites, like other Cody age bison kills. Of all, of all of them, we picked out two sites. Corner, Corner 2 is the oldest Cody site in the plains. And the points looked a lot like that, but they weren't quite like that. So we looked at Carter, Kerr, McGee, and they kind of looked like that. We thought they're going to be someplace in between for a date. When we got our date, it was smack dab in the middle. You know, sometimes it's just fun to be right. <laughs> and people think that you know what you're talking about. And that's what happened at this point. So it was perfect. So what we can see with these curry points, a lot of people have always thought, no, it's just this group makes them this way, this group makes them this way, and there's no real change through time. Things like this prove that there is a slow change through time in these, these point traditions. Uh, it's all local material, uh, well within 100 kilometers, let's say. They could have gotten this very easily. Uh, and then there's a lot of very local material, uh, solicified sediment, which outcrops right there. These others are all high, very, very good quality, not good, but not uh, solicified wood. So, this is the, the site right here. You don't see any way of taking bison successfully. Unless, of course, it's a winter kill and there's a snow drift there or something like that. Uh, this is the cultural zone you see right here where the bison bone is. Uh, this is the flanges and part of the lower leg. It came back a little bit more found in the metapodial. So there is some articulation here. This is one of our first shuttle tests out there. Uh, a unit where we found limb bone, lower limb, with articulated bones going into the wall. But for the most part, where we excavated, we found these bone piles. Just masses of bone, a bison bone. And um, again, it probably took a long time for this to get buried. So it's a very, very, very poor condition. Plus, this, all this overbird, all this material sediments are clays, which shrink, and this particular kind shrinks and swells. When it does that, it pulls bone apart and it crushes it, it comes back together. So it's a very friable condition. But these bone piles aren't unique to this site. There's another site of the very same age, just down in Nebraska a little bit, called Hudson, Maine. And there, the, thing, the famous thing about this is all the bone piles and areas where people stood while working on the bone, processing the bison. So we kind of have the same tradition we see at Hudson, Maine, 
on our side up there as far as the way you process your bison bone. Uh, these are the shovel tests. This is where points were found eroding out of the surface. Uh, we did do a little looking down here, but there was nothing there. That's all been eroded away, or never was anything there. So we went up slope and started digging our way back. Uh, this, is, this is test unit you know, one right there. That became very important to us because we found this feature right here. This big circular feature. Very different sediment and it's very soft, easy to dig, whereas outside of it, again, you know, it's the hardest stuff I've ever worked in. Another view looking down on it. Uh, here you have bison bone. This is the circular feature right here. But the thing about it is, it's this far below any other bison bone on the side. So we go, aha, we have two components. It's probably going to be also. Uh, so, everywhere we looked, we saw what appeared to be two components. This is that test unit one, and the uh, feature is right here, well beneath the rest of the other bone. Back here, we did some exploration, uh, and we put in an auger. At 60 centimeters, we hit just tons of charcoal and burned earth. We go, wow, we got a heart too. Kept going at a meter in depth, we hit another mass accumulation of charcoal. And in fact, as I was taking this picture, there's a little tiny flake that was sitting right here. The wind came up, blew it off, just before I pulled the trigger. We never could find that flake. So, the next year we came out, we dug actually with Doris McDonald and uh, uh, did most of the work on this trench. It was uh, a Murray Freud's dad. But what we found, we came down on these charcoal layers, is they were rope hands filled with charcoal. We don't know where it came from. We don't know if it's the same age charcoal. Uh, but someplace out there, there's a big mass of charcoal. But we were able to get a good definition on the stratigraphy, as well as the phytoliths from this area that give us some indicator of the plants that were around at that point in time. Question? Yes. You said road dens filled with charcoal. Yes. So why would they, did they use that to, to what? Well, we, we had a prairie dog, prairie dog, or bulls, or something like that. Uh, you could, as you're digging, and you hit charcoal, you're going to push it back out of your way. Maybe fill in an old den as you proceed, or maybe they found this charcoal beneficial to some degree, for whatever reason. I don't know. Um, but I don't think they carried it in purposely. They just <laughs> hit charcoal and moved it. To its present location. Uh, so that bone I showed you down at the bottom, well below the other bone. Well, the upper bone all dated to 96, 96, 9,969 years ago. The bone beneath that, this was dated, and I might have, I should tell you, this is purified collagen. And the bone we were using, I've never seen bone that looked like collagen was dripping out as much as this did. It was really amazing. We saw a couple of bones from the wall, and it looked like it was just dripping with the stuff. And uh, the lab said it was, yeah, collagen was marvelous, it was great. They got very, very good dates. The bone below that from this feature had no collagen left in it. So we couldn't date it conventionally like that. So we use what's called a bioappetite. It is an appetite, it's a mineral that will accumulate in the bone. And uh, we've got a more recent age of 9410. So I don't, that, that's not a good date 
doesn't reflect what we have. So there still could be an older component beneath this. Uh, so we have local lithic materials. The uh, five list we looked at, for the most part, were all C4 grasses. However, where the coating component was, we had a lot more tall grasses associated with that, and maybe some and some C3 grass, grasses. So for a short period of time, the climate got cooler and wetter, riding more grass. So, uh, so that's what we know about that side. It, we've, had, we've done very little in the way of work. We've had students out there two years, but when you've got to work that slow, it's such hard sediments, it's, uh, you don't get a lot of ground to cover. Next side, of course, is lifting bison up in Hardy County. Most of you know about lifting bison. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's just a really fun site. We went there in 2004 because Joe Manis had found these two points in early arcade. I thought, wow, early arcade campsite. I would kill to work on it. So I'll show you where it is. So we go up there, and this is what a bison kill looks like. Teeth plants. It's all that was there. We're going, okay, well, they must have a bison. Teeth last longer than any other color of bison. In this area, if a bison bone was to be exposed, it might last a few months before it disintegrates entirely. I took my trowel right there and just dug in like three times. I started hitting bison bone. Oh, crap, it's a kill site. I had never worked on a kill site. I never really wanted to. But uh, it's a well spelled out cake. It's the rarest of all site types in North America. Have an early arcade bison kill. So, from that point of view, it became fascinating to me. So, for quite a few years, we'd go out there on the weekends, uh, like three or four day weekends, or if there was, might, we might be able to spend a whole week at any one time. From 94 to 2000, we'd go out there periodically throughout the summer when time allowed. When we first started digging, Recognize those two people, don't you, Tom? Oh my God! Yeah. <laughs> we first started digging. We said, let's let's use this as a training exercise because first of all, I've never worked on a bison kill, and I wasn't sure if my methodology was what I should be using. So we said, let's just be very careful. Here you see rows. Whoop! Dang it! You hit start again for me. Sorry, Dave. Here you see Rose uh, putting preservative on the bone. Later, she cast it. Uh, you can't do that in a bison kill. You don't have that many years to work on a unit preserved and cast all the bison. So we quickly quit casting preserving the bone. What we would do, we would expose it in one unit, and we'd have to expose the bone in a unit probably three or four times. That's how thick this bison bone layer was in some areas. Uh, so this is a unit that Wild Parks is drawing. That's his drawing. And it's really wonderful when you can have an artist in the field with you drawing all this. So after we draw all the bone in, they each get a number. That's the bison bone there. And I want, I want to point out that I always do. These are the tail bones. Everything is still exactly in place as a day they kill. Wow, this is pretty marvelous. Now, you have to take into consideration how this happened. This was during what's called the ultithermal. A 4,000 year drought cycle in this part of the country. Uh, some area, sometimes there would be no vegetation here at all, and no animals, no people. Little brief windows, you get more vegetation, animals might come in, no, animals come in, people will come in. Um, but because there's very little vegetation, all the silts are blown away, and left with sand in the uplands. Now, when we had drought periods, like the ultra thermal, it didn't mean it didn't rain. 
It rang the same as it does now, except it all came at once in the winter. And when it all comes at once, it takes volumes of sediments and moves them downstream. And that's what it did here. It took volumes of sand and buried the spice and bone there. Very, very quickly. Uh, then once we got bones numbered and, let, and, and bagged, it would take top and bottom elevations on them. That's how they kept some kind of control over depth and angles and things of that nature. <laughs> Uh, and again, this is Lyle and Rose. I don't know what they're doing, but uh, some days we didn't get a lot done, some days we did. This is Graves Creek right here. This is the kill. When this kill event took place, Graves Creek was right up against this wall. So it's a very, not a big creek. I'll show you some examples of it. Uh, this is what it looked like the very last day of working out there. This area over here is where the creek, you can see the creek, the old creek channel. This is not. So we know that this stream, this goalie, the stream channel is part of this bison kill event. Uh, this is looking down on top of it with bison bones still there. Uh, it's in this area we would have one bison on top of another bison on top of another bison that was probably never ever processed, even lighter. Uh, this is at uh, the old paleo goalie or stream channel right there. Completely articulated animals. As we move away, we have complete front and rear sections articulated. Move away from that. We would have quartered sections articulated with meat stripped. And over here, individual elements and a heart. This is what it looked like a little further away where we have just the, uh, the quarters. So you can see there's quite a bit of articulation here. All the bones still in place. And this is the area we'd have individual bones, and that's the heart there. This is that goalie, and if we never did reach the bottom of it. We just didn't have time. Plus, the bone itself in this goalie, this paleo goalie, held moisture. And because it did, the bone, it was like peanut brittle, or peanut, uh, it was a peanut thing, candy bar. That once it gets wet, it turns to mush. That's what these were. Everything in that, near the base of that channel was mush. So there really wasn't any, we found no point in trying to excavate much. That's just kind of the direction we thought the drive might have taken. This terrace right here, there's dinosaurs coming out of that. It's Cretaceous. What we think is this was a lot higher landscape than that point, 9,000 or 6,000 years ago. The stream would have been running like this and over, right up against it. So we, we kind of think they were driving bison into the stream goalie up against this. Not 100% certain. So it might have driven over the top of the goalie, but the way it's laid out, it seemed like they were driven up into the goalie. This is that same paleo goalie when we're through with the excavations. You see that very, very straight line there, and the goalie continues this way, so you can't see that edge. But the bison bone is still going down in there, probably to a depth of about like this. So it is an impediment to bison. If you were to drive them in that area, you could get them to injure themselves, or get on top of each other, or uh, Hold them on it to start throwing spears at them. Just slightly away, a little ways, this is the hard pan area away from what the bison kill does. See these circular things? At first thought, we have posts that go a pound here to trap the bison, which makes a lot of sense. I excavated one of these down to the base and cross sectioned it, and it looked like clothing hook print. Ah, crap. 
Mm-hmm. It's just the location where bison sank into the soft sediments there uh, during the killing. And I, 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 since that point in time, it's been pledging me. What if I was wrong? But these word posts, that tell that leads a whole other story of this would be the oldest bison camp in North America if that would have took place like that. So that's one of the things I want to do when I go back out there is clear off more of this hard pan area and see what these really are. And if they are posts, we'll follow them out to the ends. Uh, this is the minimum number. Uh, we have just in the small area we excavated, we have a minimum number of 22 individuals. And this is the individuals by age. We have quite a few adult ones that are over 6.6 years of age, uh, a few very young ones, um, and a lot of them around two years old, and they breeding age, things of that nature. We had males and females. Although most of the males were not of this age, probably more along there. So I'm not sure why we had a mixed herd at that point in time, uh, but we did. Bison hunters in this country have been doing this for tens of thousands of years. They don't ever reinvent the result. They're very, very good at what they do because they've been doing it for so long. They understand the brain of a bison. They understand how they're going to act different times of the year, how they're going to act during rut. You don't want to take them at that point in time because you'll be taking bulls, and the bulls, because they're in rut, it's, the meat's almost inedible. You want to take bulls, you want to take them in the wintertime. Um, the cows, on the other hand, uh, you'd like to take about that during the summer, and it's because they're at their fast. They're, they've given calves already, they're through nursing, all they're doing is eating and getting fat now, so you want those calves. That's what we're really after. So they, they know all this. They know the bison, the males are going to split off right after this act of the breed. The females are going to go this way, the males are going to go that way, and we saw the other road. So they, they understand what's going on in their mind. They know when they're going to get the calves and things like that. So what do we know about this site? It's a late fall, early winter kill. Uh, 22 individuals represented. A radiocarbon date of 5,600 years ago places it in the early arcade. There's, you can't decide in Minnesota, there are three early arcade bison kills in North America. In, in the United States. So there, we have more mammoth kills than we have bison kills for this time period. Which, which that's what makes it kind of fun to work with to figure and try to figure out. The other site's up in Harding County. Well, I don't see. I don't think any of you are at this site. Um, during our surveys in Harding County, we visited this location. We located this site. So it is a bison kill. Here you see Alan Johnson working on it. This is where we excavated. You can see the bone coming out right here. I'll give you some more views of it. This is looking down at it from on top near the crest of the hill. Again, it's a slump block that slid down. Uh, it was probably an arroyo that was cutting up into the hills. This whole area is nothing but arroyos everywhere out there. There's probably hundreds of very bison kills throughout the landscape, but they have to be not exposed. This one's been eroding away for a very long time. And there's maybe six square meters left of it. It's for that reason I wanted to salvage as much as we could in a very short period of time. It's not going to be there much longer. Uh, so what you see right now for strike and dip, it dipping down slope, although that could be in the original royal dip. But it's also going this way very quickly. This is uncovering the first layer of bison bone in the back of the unit. Haven't even been exposed yet. So it dips down pretty steeply in that direction. And again, is that the angle of the arroyo, or is that because it's been sliding downhill 
internal office. Uh, when they go out on excavation, we come all the way across to find out for sure. Uh, we had some articulation, uh, minimal articulation. They were, they were butchering right on site again. The interesting thing, in some of the units, we would have maybe six pair of mandibles in one unit. Next one over, no mandibles. Next one over, no mandibles. Over here, we have more of the uh, front, front limbs. And we might represent three or four, but we see things kind of piled up, different, different elements which were selected for and moved out of the way to this location or whatever. We don't know enough about why they were doing this yet. More excavations can tell us that. But there's something cultural going on that we almost pick it up. Uh, the age, 1580. Plus or minus 30 years, uh, or 4 AD, 4 or 5 or 550. Uh, these are the points we collected. The bases are absent, so they're not entirely diagnostic. But others, other, again, other sites we look at that think of that same period are these basant like points. They're called basant points, and they're kind of corner side notched points of that nature. So we're confident. This is what those points are. Uh, so it's a late prehistoric basant site. Uh, it's the radiocarbon age, processing on site. We only excavated a very small portion, and we have multiple, multiple bison elements, bison represented in there right now. Uh, Jenna, right here, is the individual that wrote this in. Help me, Dave. And MPDF. MPDF, a multiple property domination, a nomination form. And she is in the middle of processing, going through all this bison bone, you know, left femur, left femur, right femur, right femur. Same animal, maybe not. So, so we're going to have a count based upon which elements we have from the left and the right, back and front, uh, of how many animals were in this. Three meters we excavated, multiply that times what's left, and take a guess. We've lost 80 to 90 percent of them already. That's, some, that's how successful they were at just killing them. Seasonality: late fall, early winter. Um, oh no, no. This is what what have we learned? It's just supposed to be learned. And where do we go? Uh, right now, for seasonality, for all these sites we've worked on, we have one late fall, early winter, one late spring, early summer. We'll have more data on these other, other kill sites as we have the time and ability to process the bison bone further. We have one Paleo Indian site, one early archaic site, one late archaic site, three late prehistoric sites. And we've ruled out four other sites that we've inspected in western South Dakota, western part of the state already. We're preparing for the sites, most uh, at least four, three of them from here, for the National Register right now. And uh, we need additional data on the other two sites we've been working on. And they haven't even looked at the sites to the east of us. And I haven't had a chance to get to these other sites that people have told me. Please come see this. Uh, I sure hope to get a chance to do that, and we can add that to our, to our knowledge and record. But the fun thing of what we're really trying to do is, what are the patterns out there? Are there recognizable patterns during certain climatic episodes? Um, are there you know, certain things that they're doing? Are they all taking vice in the same way, or are we seeing a change through time? Um, you know, things of that nature. That's what we're looking for. We're trying to uncover the past, and we're looking for the culture, the ideas, the mindsets that went into the success of these bison kills. How did they set themselves up to be successful? Again, I already mentioned, these people have been doing it for tens of thousands of years. They're very good at it. But what we try to do as anthropologists is 
look at how did their culture allow them to incorporate the landscape, the time period, vegetation, all this into successful bison kills. How did they envision the landscape? When they looked out there and said, okay, our bison kill is going to be there because of what? <laughs> so. But anyway, some, some thanks to some people, Jim Hay, uh, who pushed me to go out and work on one of these bison kills, but many bison kills at many sites throughout the state. Uh, I start, uh, Jenna Detmar Carlson, I've been working hand in hand with on this. From the Historic Preservation Office, Steve Holman, Center for American Paleolithic Research, and Mark Muniz, St. Cloud State University are some of the agencies that have helped do this. But most importantly, I can't emphasize this enough, the gratitude and sincere thanks I have members of the South Dakota Archaeological Society without which none of this ever would have been done. So, that's the end of my presentation. I want you to all have a safe trip going home tonight. Any questions? Or observations? Or thoughts? I yes. had a couple of thoughts in your comments. You commented once that uh, showed a rolling landscape up there about how difficult it would have been to drive bison over the, this type of area. And so comment on that, yes, anybody, it's, it's, it's a fool's errand to try to drive buffalo anywhere. Even men on horseback have a hard time driving bison here. So you can know, only imagine how hard it would be natives on foot trying to drive bison here. Okay, well, so part two of my story is you commented on the, uh, the kill sites with multiple components, and there's just so very few of them. And my reasoning on what, why that might be is because bison, you know, they're gonna, not going to be in the same area year after year, time after time. You know, they may be here one year, the next year they're 20 miles north. So these natives may not have been able to rely on these multi, multi sure they may have liked to have taken over these ideal places that they used for generations in the past, but the bison were going to always cooperate. So perhaps many of these kill sites are just one-time only things. You know, the bison just went through a certain area, the natives 